Hello and welcome to City Life. I'm Beverly Thompson, your host. What do you want in your bus service? Or if you don't ride the bus, what would entice you to do so? Joining me now to talk about how they are designing a better bus service for Durham and what it means for you is John Talmadge with Triangle Transit. Welcome, John, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Beverly. John, Triangle Transit has been operating data for the city of Durham for about two years now. Why design a better bus service now, or a better bus system now, and what were your goals in doing so? This is actually something that's been in the works uh, for a while. It takes a, quite a bit of effort to go talk to customers, talk to stakeholders in the community, and figure out what the needs are and how well the service is, is matching those needs. Mm -hmm. It's something that every business has to do on a periodic basis. Make sure the products that they're offering, the services that they're offering, are doing the best job they can at meeting those customer needs. Mm -hmm. uh, we started immediately upon uh, entering in the contract with the city, talking to customers, talking to neighborhood groups, talking to stakeholders in the community like the big uh, university institutions, Durham Tech, and, and city government, county government offices, and other businesses, uh -huh. and started to hear from them what they wanted out of the system. And we've arrived at four goals. Uh, and the first of those goals is creating an environment that's safe mm -hmm. and that feels safe to the customers and to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is providing services that are reliable and that the service quality is meeting customer expectations. Uh -huh. The third is being financially responsible and that means matching the services better with where the demands are, being as efficient as we can with the city's limited resources in providing these transit services. Mm -hmm. And the fourth is providing services that support economic development and support educational opportunities for the, for the community, for the members of uh, Durham. Okay. John, why was it so important for you to involve so many stakeholders, say especially the public in this whole process? Yeah, you know, we started with the customers because we move 22,000 people a day, 22,000 wow. boardings uh, every day. And we want to make sure that the service is meeting those customers' needs. Mm -hmm. We can't hope to entice new people to ride uh, unless we're doing a good job with, with the current service. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's where we started. We also knew that there are stakeholders, there are neighborhood groups, there are the members, the communities uh, that are interested in using the services and so we wanted to hear what they want, and why, that's why we went out to talk to them. Okay, and that's a very important thing to do, to listen to your stakeholders. But after observing the current system, uh, you say your number one goal was to address safety. Uh, why was that so important? Well, one of the other things that we started to do, one of the ways that we reached out to customers is to hold a monthly uh, public meeting at, at Durham Station. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also did an onboard survey where we asked customers to rate the system on a whole host of variables. And uh, one of the, those issues that we were hearing on a recurring basis was, uh, I don't feel safe in when I see what uh, certain uh, other riders are doing. Mm -hmm. I'm the way I can get to the bus stop, the bus stop is not located uh, in as, as safe a place as it should be. And so that's, that's one place, uh, or really what drives that, that goal. The other is the resident survey that the city does every year. Mm -hmm. uh, the score on that was not high. Uh, people's perceptions, whether they ride or not, was, was not that high. And we know that this is both uh, things that we need to work on, and we can do that by reducing overcrowding and, and other strategies. And it's also perception, and mm -hmm. so uh, we'll be working on that as well. So it's a combination of both perception and actual reality, I yeah. guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know your second goal was service quality. What did your customers tell you about the on-time performance of the system? Well, again, on that survey, uh, that is the number one uh, request for improvement, is make sure that the buses are running on time. Mm -hmm. Right now, they run on time uh, a little better than 60% of the trips. Uh, and that you feel that in two different ways if you're riding a bus. One is when you're standing out at a bus stop waiting. Uh, the schedule says it's going to be there at a certain time. Mm -hmm. And it creates uncertainty if the bus is not there at that time. The other is because of the type of city we live in, uh, there are a lot of times people have to go from one bus to another to connect through uh, in downtown. And if buses are running late, they're missing transfers. And so those are re really important to really improve the experience that people have on the buses. The other reason um, that we need to improve it is because we, ha we track this. Uh -huh. We know that, that this is not just perception of customers uh, mm -hmm. complaining, that 
Uh, we measure the buses every time they're out on the road, uh -huh. and, and we know where the problems are and how uh -huh. to address them. Well, let's talk about fiscal responsibility. I mean, I think most people, or most administrators, I guess most riders probably don't know, the bus systems don't pay for themselves. I mean, you don't collect enough fares at the fare box to do that. How does this whole effort help improve fiscal responsibility? Well, uh, it's true that the city has finite resources to devote to, uh, to the transit services. And so we need to be as efficient as possible with the dollars that the city is putting in. Mm -hmm. um, today, the, the system pretty much provides the same quality of service in terms of how frequent the buses come uh, throughout the city. Mm -hmm. And that is true on the corridors where uh, there are standees much of the time because there's so much demand, as well as places where people may see fewer, fewer riders during mm -hmm. times of day. Mm -hmm. And so this is an effort to uh, look at that, where are people using the services, and to match up how frequent we provide the services and where we provide the services with, with where those demands are. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know the final goal was to improve connections to important destinations in Durham. How is this missing from the current service or the current system? Yeah, the, the current system does connect to all the universities, mm -hmm. the community college, the major employment uh, locations and the major uh, neighborhoods where people are living. But it's not always the most direct connection. Uh -huh. And uh, sometimes it requires a transfer where one might not be mm. needed. And so it was really looking at how to make those, that access more direct to the, the major job centers and the educational institutions. There are uh, uh, some high schools that are not currently served. And so we also have been looking at how to extend service uh, to those locations. Mm -hmm. I know some parents would be glad to hear that. Um, I know, okay, you've got your key goals identified now. Um, looking at all of this as a big picture, what will all of this accomplish for the bus system? Well, we think that we're gonna, we've got strategies in this plan to meet all of those goals. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of safety, what people will uh, see is uh, improvements at the bus stop level. Uh, and also reduced overcrowding, which we think creates uh, a, m quite a bit of the conflict that uh, might ex people might experience on buses. Uh, improving that on-time performance to 90% from that 61% level that it's at today. We think that's the, the first thing that people will see in improvements and uh, should have a, a significant effect on their, the quality of their experience. Oh. And it's not just uh, that they'll be on time, but it does reduce stress levels for people when they're riding the bus. It mm -hmm. reduces stress levels for drivers. There are lots of benefits to uh, being reliable with the service. Okay. Um, again, I, I've mentioned the matching up the service uh, where it's being used. Mm -hmm. and so people will see more frequent service in some corridors and less frequent uh, in others. But on balance, uh, we're going to see the bulk of today's ridership is provided better quality service than, than before. Uh, and then we mentioned the, the connections to the institutions, the job centers and the educational institutions being more direct. Uh, when you're starting out on a, on a street, knowing more or less that you're going to continue on it until you get to that destination. Okay, good information, good background. But I know we probably need to talk about a few more details that people want to hear about. So we're going to take a quick break right now. And coming up in the next segment, how will Triangle Transit put their recommendations for a better bus system into action? And how will it affect you? We'll be right back. Bacteria is the leading cause of tooth decay, which is the number one chronic childhood disease. Ugh, that ain't no fairy tale. What? Tell the kids of America how to prevent tooth decay. Do I get a superhero costume? A tooth fairy? Kids of America. You gotta brush them, floss them, and rinse them twice a day. Visit the dentist and go to americastoothfairy.org to help rescue a kid from pain. Let's get her done. <laughs> Welcome back to City Life. With your involvement, Triangle Transit now has some key recommendations to improve the data bus system. Joining me again to talk more about that is John Talmadge. Thanks for staying with us, John. Sure. John, I know you earlier shared that your number one goal was to improve safety. How does this new plan accomplish that? The first is reducing the overcrowding where there's standees on a lot of trips. And the places that people are going uh, where we see that is the Village Shopping Center out in East Durham along mm -hmm. uh, Holloway Street. Mm -hmm. uh, second is people traveling to Northgate Mall uh, from downtown. 
Uh, the third is North Carolina Central University uh, from a couple different corridors, and so reducing that overcrowding. And then uh, people going to Durham Tech, so during those school hours in particular, uh, providing more frequent service. And that's how we address the overcrowding is instead of every 30 minutes, have a bus come every 15 minutes uh -huh. during those times of day. Okay. The second way is to improve. It's not on the bus, but uh, where you're waiting for the bus or getting to the bus. Mm -hmm. And so the, the plan outlines making improvements to 200 bus stops throughout the system. 200 sounds like a lot. There are well over 1,300 bus stops oh, okay. in the system. So this doesn't get to every single last bus stop, but we'll be able to get to where most of the people are, are using the system. Uh -huh. And the third is uh, improving the access to it. So we have three corridors. It's the Holloway Street corridor, Fayetteville Street, and uh, Roxboro Street, north of downtown, where we'll be able to make improvements to the sidewalk and connections mm -hmm. uh, across streets and the streets leading to the bus stops. Mm -hmm so that uh, we complete some of those sidewalk ne networks. And this works with the city's sidewalks plan uh, in, in doing that. Mm -hmm. The fourth is there are s some key locations where there's heavy uh, loads of people who are waiting to board the bus. Uh, our customers at Northgate, at the Village Shopping Center, down at South Point uh, Mall, uh, and other places where we have bu more than one bus meeting, mm -hmm. uh, identifying those locations for improvements so there's ample space for people to wait and be under shelter. Mm -hmm. Okay. How is all of this going to work together to improve service quality? So the, again, the service quality uh, factor that we're really aiming to improve is the on-time performance. Mm -hmm. And that uh, is requiring uh, us to look at every single route, and we have done that with the help of a consultant, and identified what the operating speed is and how long we can go. And so there are s adjustments to every single route in the system that would be made uh, through this plan in order to make sure we can operate 90% on time. Mm -hmm. uh, the other service quality improvement is really those frequency improvements uh, that come throughout the plan. But I think that what people will notice first is uh, all the adjustments that are being made to make the buses run on time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I want to ask you something. I, I hear a lot of people say that, you know, I drive around, I see the data buses, a lot of times there are only four or five people on them at any given time, and which means to them that this system isn't operating as efficiently as it could. How does this plan address that issue? Or is that even a, a false premise or a true premise? Well, I hear that as well. And uh, when you look at the ridership on the system and the loads on board the buses and you compare it to other cities. The city of Durham does very well. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, for every trip out, uh, one-way trip, there are on average 17 people on board. Now, that's an average. Mm -hmm. And so it means that at peak times there are standees and that means there's well over 30, sometimes 40 people. At other times uh, or places along the route there are fewer. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we've done this look at when are people using the routes, where are they using the routes, and trying to balance the amount of service that's provided in these locations. Uh, in most places, this is uh, either improving frequency in the segments that are most heavily used, uh, going from 30 minutes to only once an hour in the segments that aren't well used, mm -hmm. and in a few isolated cases, uh, not propo we're proposing not to provide service any longer. If we look at uh, how many people get on board at every stop in the system? Out of those 22,000 daily stops, only 190 would not be within a short walk mm -hmm. of uh, the newly recommended services. You said 22,000? 22,000 daily boardings on, on board the buses, mm -hmm. and only 190 that would not have a short walk to, to mm. the bus in the new scenario. Okay, all right. Well, let's talk about community benefits overall. How would this plan help support economic development? The Economic development that we've defined is really access to jobs and access to the educational opportunities. Okay. And the number one job center in Durham is that corridor around Irwin Road, which is Duke Medical Center and the VA Medical mm -hmm. Centers. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's the single biggest private employer in uh, all of the triangle. And so looking at how can we provide more direct service to that. and it, the plan provides new corridors from the north and from the south that would come in, and more frequent service uh, from the west and from Chapel Hill. 
Uh, it also, in later uh, scenario of the plan, has service even from as far north as Rougemont and uh, parts of or northern Orange County into the Duke Medical Center where mm -hmm. there are concentrations of employees. Uh, but it also improves frequency. So this builds a 15 minute, a frequent bus network where the buses would run every 15 minutes and it would connect to North Carolina Central University, to Durham Tech. Uh, it would connect those uh, places and others with, uh, with Northgate Mall uh, and with Durham Regional Hospital and down uh, toward the the South Square area, uh, 15501. Mm -hmm. So supporting people moving back and forth uh, in those corridors to these major employment locations, whether they're the, the jobs at the medical center uh, or retail jobs at some of these other outlets, we think providing that 15 minute frequency is gonna be attractive to a lot more people. Oh yeah, definitely. The, the other educational access that we provide, I mentioned before, is looking at all the high schools. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in this plan, uh, Riverside, which was the high school that wasn't served before, uh, Jordan, uh, Hillside has improved service, uh, more routes serve, would serve Hillside High School. Uh, all of the, the public high schools in Durham Public Schools would be uh, connected in the network. John, it's obvious you've put a lot of time and effort into this whole plan and you've gotten a lot of public input, which is a good thing, but any plan comes with a cost. What is it for this one? Well, let me talk about the, the public input that we've received. We've done over 40 public meetings uh, in the different phases of this okay. and uh, had hundreds of people involved. We've also had a sounding board, which is really an advisory group of Durham citizens, mostly riders, some not riders, that have walked through this whole process with us mm -hmm. and given us great feedback in order to shape this. Mm -hmm. The plan itself has three scenarios. The mm -hmm. first scenario uh, is can be implemented right away because mm -hmm. it assumes no new revenue sources. There's, uh -huh. uh, the sources that pay for the system today are Durham local taxes. Uh -huh. There are uh, state grants, there are federal grants, and there are, of course, the fares paid by uh, the customers who ride every day. Mm -hmm. uh, the f this initial scenario where we have all the on-time performance improvements, uh, we're actually able to do more efficiently than today's system, mm -hmm. and so we reduce the number of hours. Uh -huh. Uh, the expansions of service where we go to 15 minute frequency on more corridors and provide the new access to uh, Duke and the, the medical centers there uh, do require more money. Mm -hmm. And so what we, uh, those were outlined in the county bus and rail investment plan last year that the county adopted and the city endorsed. The first is a vehicle registration fee mm -hmm. and that's scenario two is what could we do with that increase in $10 vehicle registration fee. Mm -hmm. And those are the two new routes into Duke uh, and uh, some more improved frequency to North Carolina Central University. Mm -hmm. uh, then the third scenario is the major expansion and that requires the half cent sales tax that was approved by 60% of Durham's voters last November. Mm -hmm. Uh, both of those ha require action by uh, the county commissioners, and so uh, we're waiting for them to make a decision before we can implement those, those changes. I see. So there are some revenue options there. It's just going to require some discussion and decision making, obviously. So tell us what the next steps are and where can our viewers go if they want more information. Yeah, so the draft plan was released in, at the end of March, and we got feedback. We had a uh, April uh, public hearing before the City Council, mm -hmm. and we're shaping the final plan, which uh, should be done in the next uh, two weeks. Uh -huh. So we'll be resubmitting that to uh, the Durham City Council for their uh, consideration at their June 18th meeting. Mm -hmm. There'll be a June 6th public meeting at Durham Station in the evening uh, where we'll share the what's in the final plan and what changes were made from the draft plan. Mm -hmm. uh, the action, if the City Council takes action in June, then there are just a few uh, implementation dates and those would be uh, October would be the primary October. or the initial changes uh -huh. and they'd be pretty limited uh, and then most of the changes would take place in January of 2013, mm -hmm. so uh, halfway into the, the fiscal year for the, for the city. Mm -hmm. uh, all the details can be found online at mm -hmm. dbbs.gotriangle.org. Mm -hmm. okay. 
Uh, and we will be working very hard to explain to people uh, the changes if the city council approves them well in advance of them so that they know what to expect. Okay. All right. John, thank you so much for joining me. This has been a very informative show about changes, possible changes underway for the data system. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. All right. Coming up next, we're going to take a close look at litter, why you should care about trash in our community, and why you should help make a difference. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to City Life. Litter, garbage, trash, or just plain ugly. Whatever you call it, it's an eyesore and it hurts our community. Joining me now to talk about why this problem goes far beyond simple trash on the roadside and how you and a litter grabber can make a big difference is Tanya Doutlich with Keep Durham Beautiful. Welcome, Tanya, and thanks so much Thank for joining you. me. I so appreciate nice to be here. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Tanya, many of our viewers may not think that a little trash on the road is such a big deal. Why does it matter? Well, littering is illegal. Um, whether it's intentional or unintentional, it carries a fine of 250 to up to thousands of dollars, depending on the frequency mm -hmm. with which people have littered. And it also often carries community service hours. Oh, okay. Additionally, it's harmful to the environment. It's dangerous for, for animals. It creates dangerous conditions for fish and other wildlife that might be in our streams and rivers and lakes that our Durham streets feed runoff into. Mm -hmm. It can clog the stormwater drains. And this causes a backup and unsafe driving conditions. And it can lead to toxins and other harmful chemicals that are generated from the litter that is left in the streets mm -hmm. and in parks and uh, along um, highways. Okay. Finally, litter harms property values. When people um, see litter around a home, they certainly aren't interested in living near there or purchasing a home. Mm -hmm. People aren't interested in frequenting businesses that have litter around them. This decreases their revenue. Mm -hmm. And when visitors come to Durham, their perception of our community and uh, their perception of the way that we take care of our community community is lessened mm -hmm. by seeing litter on okay. the roadways. So it is a big deal in other words, huh? It is, okay. absolutely. All right. So Tanya, is it just people throwing trash out of their windows or the car windows rather? What other sources are contributing to this? Well, we do have people who just simply toss their trash out the window, um, fast food bags or soda bottles. We also have people who throw cigarette butts out the window. Mm. And cigarette butts are a huge source of litter. Mm -hmm. It's actually the number one littered object in the United States. And we also get litter from drivers who are driving trucks or mm. trailers uh -huh. that aren't properly covered or secured. And this is largely unintentional litter, but it is a very large cause of the litter that we see on the streets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tanya, so what's the next step to fix it? I mean, how, what do we do? Well, get busy picking up litter is the number one thing. Okay. Um, if you see it, pick it up. That's what I say to myself all the time, and I'm teaching my children that. It's easy to say, but difficult to remember. It's a lot easier to just step over a piece of litter yeah. on the ground. Mm -hmm. But I remind myself, and I'm thinking about it every day, and I would encourage everyone else to do the same. You can organize a street cleanup in your neighborhood or along a street that you see, that you frequent, that is particularly littered. And picking up litter is an important first step because when people see litter on the ground, they're more likely to throw litter in the same place or to just mm -hmm. think, oh, this space is not cared for. I'm not gonna care for it either. If they see a clean street, a clean yard, a clean park, they're going to feel less comfortable dropping their own trash there mm -hmm. and they're gonna, going to seek out a place where they can properly dispose of their litter. Mm -hmm. So you have a bigger message then. Well, I didn't throw it down there, so why should I pick it up? It's your community, right? 
do what you can to help keep it clean. That's right. Right. So how can Keep Durham Beautiful help if our viewers want to get a cleanup started? Well, as I mentioned, we um, encourage people to organize community cleanups. And so we, as Keep Durham Beautiful, are able to supply tools for a community cleanup. The tools that we enjoy supplying and people like to use are litter grabbers. Mm -hmm. um, these are long tools with a grabby end, and kids especially love using these. Uh -huh. We also supply trash bags, gloves, and safety vests to protect people from possible traffic so that they can be visible mm -hmm. along the roadways. And we encourage people to adopt places around Durham to make them sort of their own special project. Mm -hmm. Some of the places that we have available for adoption are parks, mm -hmm. roadways, streets, um, bus stops, um, interestingly. Um, we can provide people with a regular bus route or a couple of stops that they can pick up cigarette butts and other trash that accumulates. They can also report on graffiti or other problems that they might see at the shelter. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our bus stops have trash cans at them to encourage people to properly dispose mm -hmm. of their trash. And um, that's been a very successful program that mm -hmm. we've enjoyed. And also people can adopt streams uh -huh. in Durham. So you make it easy for people. That's we do. That's a good thing. What other programs do you offer in addition to the tools you just named? Well, Keep Durham Beautiful is, our mission is to engage and inspire individuals to take greater responsibility for their community environment. We're a nonprofit and we're a volunteer powered organization whose mission is to improve the appearance of Durham. We have a three pronged approach to this effort. We focus on beautification and that involves planting trees and also flower bulbs and shrubs. And we also encourage people to recycle and educate about waste reduction and the litter prevention, mm -hmm. as we've talked about. Mm -hmm. In order to assist with the beautification, we offer a grants program where communities can apply for small grants that enable them to do larger beautification projects in their perhaps neighborhood entrance or school front yard. And um, our next funding cycle for applications for these community um, beautification grants is August 31st. Mm -hmm. We also partner with the city's solid waste department to educate about waste reduction and um, recycling. And finally, we collaborate to plant trees through the Durham Tree Alliance. And we distribute bulbs to beautify the community. Okay. Is it planting trees just for beautification or is it a bigger purpose? Well, having trees contributes a lot to a community. We all know that trees add beauty, but they add so much more benefits mm -hmm. that may surprise you. They provide shade, which lowers temperature and energy bills. Mm -hmm. They reduce noise, light, and air pollution and contribute to physical and mental health oh. that studies have shown. Uh -huh. They also capture carbon dioxide, rainfall, and runoff. And they increase property values by lowering crime and contributing to a sense of community. Many of our older trees, especially willow oaks, are reaching the end of their healthy lifespan and are dying naturally. Uh -huh. Additionally, trees that are pruned away from power lines or from construction can become damaged and um, become unhealthy and need to be cut down. Mm -hmm. So our tree planting in Durham has lagged behind the rate of removal of trees oh. and that's why we're seeing an importance in planting more trees. Mm -hmm. We're trying to be very conscious as we plant these trees that the trees that we're replacing are suitable for the environment that we're putting them in. I There's see. this saying, right tree, right place. Mm -hmm. And so we try to put trees that are not going to reach a height that's above the power line so uh -huh. that they won't have to be pruned severely. And so they're smaller trees. That means we need to actually plant more trees um, so that we can maintain the canopy that we've all grown accustomed to and grown to love in Durham. Uh -huh. How does KDB then help with this whole tree planting program? I know you do some specific things to help. We do. Providing this the city with trees costs a lot of money. Uh -huh. And the current funding levels don't cover all of the costs involved in the purchase of trees. Mm -hmm. Some of the costs involved include shipping, planting, staking the trees, mm -hmm. um, 
providing watering services, mulching, and um, really taking care of them until they're firmly established. Uh -huh. And Keep Durham Beautiful can help by providing residents and businesses with an opportunity to contribute to our city's treescape by contributing ten to fifty dollars per tree and these matching funds can double the number of trees that we have the opportunity to plant. Uh -huh. Important program. We teach residents to help care for the trees also. Uh -huh. And we provide gator bags. These are special bags that go around the base of the trees. Mm -hmm. And then we, we ask the residents to sort of adopt the tree and put the water into the gator bags once a week. And this sends the right amount of water into the tree to give it a really healthy start and improve its chances of survival. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know you have an awesome program here, and people need to find out more information about KDB, so you need to tell us how to do that. Well, thank you. Um, they can visit our website. I would encourage viewers to go to www.keepdurhambeautiful.org mm -hmm. and learn how they can get involved. We have information about all of our programs, the adoption programs and, and the tree programs. Or they can call us at 919-354-2729. Also, people may be interested in following us on Facebook or on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And finally, you can donate to us. Keep Turn Beautiful is a nonprofit organization, so your donation is tax deductible, and you can pick how you want your gift to be used, and we'll put those dollars to work right here in Durham. All right, sounds great. Thank you so much for coming on to talk about this litter problem that we're having in Durham and how people can get involved. You're much welcome. Very yeah. important message. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for Thank the opportunity. You. Uh -huh. Well, that does it for this edition of City Life. If you have a comment or a future show idea, email us or call us. We'd love to hear from you. Also, don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, and you can also watch all of the city's programming on demand from DTV8 website and your city's YouTube channel. I'm Beverly Thompson. Thank you so much for joining me to learn more about city life in Durham.